Hey guys, today I'm going to be showing you how to make this electric foundry that I've used for melting aluminium. This is by far the easiest and cheapest way that I've found so far to melt aluminium. And this is a forge or a foundry that runs entirely off electricity. This is what's called a resistance foundry since it runs off electrical resistance. And the heating element is a very cheap kiln heating element made for high temperatures and I bought it off eBay for only £3. This foundry is very well insulated using alumina silica fire bricks and after running it for hours the outside of it never gets over 100 degrees Celsius despite the inside being almost a thousand. I've been casting aluminium for over three years now and the first time I ever did metal casting was when I was 13 back in early 2013. I did that using a hairdryer and a barbecue and a soup can and it actually ended up being alright. Since then I've made various different forges, all getting larger and larger and I started to use graphite crucibles which were much better and much safer and I could melt larger volumes of aluminium. But the problem with all of these forges is they were powered by coal which gives off a lot of dirty gases and harmful carcinogens that aren't good to breathe in and it's also quite expensive to run and not very good for the environment. On top of that they're incredibly noisy and they're also prone to having accidents like this if you overheat the crucible. But today I'm going to be showing you how to make by far my best forge yet. It's completely silent and it heats up incredibly quickly. In fact it gets up to melting aluminium temperatures in around 15 minutes. So let's see how you make it. First step is to find a power lead with a mains fused plug on it. And you can get these pretty much anywhere but I got mine off an old radiator. A quick note, all of the electricity that I'm talking about and using in this video is mains voltage which is 230 volts at 50 hertz AC and the max amperage that you can run through that is around 13 amps. So if you have a different electricity supply, your setup might be slightly different to mine. Another safety note to point out is that we're working with lethal currents and voltages here, so don't be doing anything with electricity if you don't have at least a basic understanding of how it works and how to protect yourself from getting electrocuted. The next step is to strip the cable and expose the live, the earth and the neutral wires. The next step is to actually get your resistance kiln wire, which is going to be the heating element. And as I said before, I bought this off eBay. I ended up using around 1.5 meters of this wire. Now I'm going to do a little experiment to find the right resistance of the wire so that I get good heating and I don't burn out the coils. If your coil is too short then the resistance will be too low and too much current will flow, the coil will get too hot and it will melt. If your coil is too long then there's too much resistance and not enough current flows so it doesn't get hot enough. The temperature that you want to be achieving is around when the wire is just on the transition between glowing red and glowing yellow. If it's glowing completely yellow that's a little bit too hot and it's easily damaged and will break over time. But if it's glowing just above orange then that's around the perfect temperature for melting aluminium. Before we connect the wires up to the mains voltage, they need to be stretched because at the moment they're not really working as a single wire, they're working sort of as a spring where all of the contacts are shorted out together. So we need to stretch them so that all of the contacts are isolated from each other. Make sure this stretch is even because if you don't stretch it out or stretch it out unevenly, something like this happens and your coil doesn't heat up evenly, which is bad. So first I'm just going to try a single 1 meter length of the coil. As you can see the resistance is quite low and it heats up to glowing red almost instantly but I think this is too much. So I attached two pieces together using a threaded rod and tested it again but this time it was too long and the wire wouldn't get hot enough. I shortened the wire so it was around 1.5 coils long so around 1 meter 50 and that was the perfect length. The connection between the two wires was easily made just by winding them both onto an M6 threaded rod and cutting it off very short and crimping it with pliers. I can then cut my wire to the desired length and measure the resistance. So the resistance is around 33 ohms when cold and obviously as the wire heats up the resistance is going to increase because it acts sort of like a filament bulb. I can use Ohm's law to work out that the max current flow is going to be 7.5 amps. That's easily lower than the 13 amp max on the circuit breakers in my house. I can then use P equals I squared R to work out that this is going to be around a 1.8 kilowatt heating element which is really powerful. So now it's time to make the actual forge itself and for the insulation of the forge I'm going to be using these alumina silicate fire bricks. I purchased these off eBay because they've got really really good insulation properties and they've got very high max temperature. These were quite expensive and they're around £25 for 5 of them for the price that I bought them and you could maybe get them cheaper if you bought them in a higher quantity. And for this forge you're going to need 9 of them so that's roughly about £50 worth of bricks. There are other cheaper forms of insulation but I wanted this forge to be quite efficient and very well insulated. You could also use a combination of plaster of Paris and sand or you could use fiberglass wool insulation. These bricks measure 230 by 114 by 76 millimeters. I'm going to be arranging my fire bricks in a structure like this which is going to then insulate all the way around the crucible and let it get really hot. 
Remember that my wire coil is around 1m50 long and one circle all the way around the brick on the inside to make one coil of wire takes around 44cm so that means I can get about 3.5 turns in. I want the majority of my turns to be in the bottom half of the brick so that then the temperature will rise. So what I do is I lay my bricks out like this so that all four of them are joined together very close and I measure every 6cm up one edge and make a mark, then do the same on the other edge. Using a long ruler and a pencil I can then join these lines up together. This means that then when I put my bricks back in a square shape this line will form a coil going all the way up the sides where I can put my coils. I'm now going to be shaping the brick using a file but remember this brick contains silicate and breathing in silica dust gives you silicosis which is really bad for your lungs so make sure you wear a dust mask while doing this. Now using a regular metal file I'm just going to slowly file into the bricks and these bricks are really soft and really easy to shape so this isn't a very hard task. I make this groove so that it's around 6 or 7 millimeters wide and easily deep enough to house the entire coil. I then repeat this process for every single line on the bricks making sure to follow them exactly and make them all the same depth and the same width and then checking with the coil to check that it fits in very snugly. Once all the grooves are cut I can then arrange the bricks back in the order that they were originally cut in and put them in the square shape and start to spiral the coil inside and I can see that it fits quite nicely. The problem is this insulation isn't very good yet since you can see that there's all these gaps out the sides. So I'm going to be fixing that using another half of a fire brick. I want to make these corners rounded so they only use up half a fire brick so it only takes two fire bricks to cover all four corners. So I place one brick in the corner and then join up the line between two different bricks. Then again wearing a dust mask I can easily cut the brick using a wood saw. I go nice and slowly so I make sure that I don't crack the very soft brick and I make sure that I hoover up all the dust afterwards. I can then use the same brick to cut another slot all the way down so that I get two triangles out of one brick. The same thing is then done for the second brick and then I can arrange them all in the structure like this and I think it looks quite good. This brick is really soft and easy to break so I need to create a steel frame going all the way around it to hold it together and to strengthen it and I'm going to be using 90 degree angle iron for that. This is quite expensive and the going rate is about £10 per metre. I mark on the length that I need and then mark on the 45 degree angle to cut it at and then cut it using my angle grinder. I cut the section out using my angle grinder. I can then use my bench vise to bend the metal at an angle that I need. Once I got it at the right angle I then welded it using my very cheap arc welder that I recently bought. This creates a very strong 45 degree bend and I can then put it on and mark where the next bend needs to be. The process is then repeated until I get all the way around to the start and I need to cut it off and then I can join it together. It took quite a lot of work but once it's all joined together and tack welded together I can see that it's all in the right shape and it holds the bricks in place. I can then coil up the wire and test how well it insulates it. You can see that it gets hot really quick and it easily maxes out my 530 degree infrared thermometer. I decided to test whether it could actually melt aluminium and I suspected that it could so I put in my graphite crucible and put in some aluminium. Sure enough 20 minutes later and it's completely molten. So now I've established that it works and that the frame fits, it's time to grind off all of the weld beads and make it just smooth metal. This is now one solid ring of steel. However it is a little bit ugly and I don't really like the way that it looks, so when I need to make the second one for the top half I'm going to make it slightly differently. This time I'm going to cut each metal section to length beforehand, then clamp them all together and then weld them all as separate pieces instead of using one single piece and just bending it. And I think this way will produce much cleaner edges and make it much nicer, even though it does require more welding and grinding. Once I've measured and cut all of the pieces and cut them at the right angles I can then assemble them onto the frame. I can then tack weld everything together to make sure that it's all in the right place. Once I'm happy with the tack welding I can then take it off the forge and weld in all of the gaps and seams. And as before I can then grind off all of the weld beads to make it perfectly flat and smooth metal. If I'd thought of this method before I made the other one I would have probably done them both like this since I think this method worked a lot better and created a much more accurate shape. Once I place the rings over the top and the bottom you can see the forge is already held really firmly together. 
The friction between the two pieces and the bricks is strong enough so that none of the bricks move when I push them. I'm going to be adding side panels that connect both the top and the bottom rings together and they're going to be bolted together. I said to punch and drill a 6mm hole in a piece of steel flat bar. This flat bar cost me about £6 per metre and I'm going to be using 1.5 metres. I then use an angle grinder and a thin cut off wheel to cut almost all of the way through the flat bar just below the hole. Then I reverse it in my vise and I can easily bend it back to a 90 degree angle. To increase the strength of this 90 degree angle, I then weld all the way along the edge to make it nice and strong. I can then completely cut this flat bar off at 90 degrees using my angle grinder. I can then tip the forge on its side and weld it to the top ring that's going all the way around the top. I can then grind that weld smooth and then take another piece of flat bar with a 6mm hole in, but this time cut it off completely. I can then use welding magnets to hold that piece in place on the bottom bracket going all the way around the bottom. And again use my arc welder to weld that to the bottom frame. When that's done an M6x50 threaded bolt can fit very nicely between the two and you can easily tighten it up with a screwdriver and it pulls the entire construction really tight. I then repeat that process to create a second bracket on the other side so that I've got two brackets pulling the whole structure very tight together. I then replace those short M6 bolts with some 100mm long ones and cut another flat bar with two holes in it that would fit over it. I took another one of the fire bricks and cut it in half so that I created two thinner fire bricks which, which can act as the base. Then using that last piece of flat bar I could fit it over and tighten up the nuts to hold them both on the bottom. Unfortunately as I was doing it it actually managed to crack the bricks when I tried to move it because these bricks are very weak and you've got to remember that they're very brittle. I realised that to hold on the base properly I'm going to need actually four legs and going to have four different points of clamping down instead of just two which is going to spread out the pressure and also hold it all together properly. So I repeated the same process with the flat bar and drilling holes to create two more clamps on either side so this is now on each of the long flat pieces got one clamp so it's got four different clamps pulling everything together. Despite this half of the brick being broken I'm still going to use them since they were quite expensive. I used a wood saw to chop off the protruding corners that were sticking out the edge of the forge and then I used a wood rasp to file away all of the material so that it would be able to sit flush on the base and it would easily clear the metal outside. Once everything's set and flat on the bottom I can then put on my piece of flat bar attaching to two of the four legs this time and tighten up the nuts very slightly but not too tight. I can then take a second piece of flat bar again with a 6mm hole in and place it over one of the other legs and measure how long it needs to be. It's then cut and put in place making sure that it's pointing straight down the middle then using my arc welder I just weld it to the main central support beam. I then do the same thing with a third piece of metal with a hole in so that there's a cross in the middle which is going to support the entire base and make it strong even with the fractured bricks. I can then tighten up all of the nuts on the feet to make sure that everything is nice and strong. Once it is I can then remove the base and I need to make a hole where the live wire will be able to enter into the forge. I drill a hole in the side of the steel flat bar and then all the way through the bricks right in one of the bottom corners where I'm going to have my coil enter. I then take another piece of M6 threaded rod and thread it into the end of my heating element. Onto it I attach two nuts and two washers and then I can take my wire and wrap it inside the washers and then crush them together holding the wire in really tightly and really securely. This is a connection that is not going to break with lots of heat. The excess threaded rod can then be cut off with a hacksaw. I then take it apart and put the wire through the hole that I made in the flat bar and tighten everything up again. I made a small indent in the bricks where the nut can fit in and it will insulate the wire from getting too hot. I can then place on my four bottom bricks and attach on the supporting metal and then tighten up all of the nuts. I then find where I want the coil to leave the forge and this is going to be right at the top and I carefully drill another 6mm hole all the way through one side. I can then insert the neutral wire through this hole and do the same thing with the threaded rod and make the same crimping attachment. This is what it looks like once I've got everything set up. I've got the coil attached to one side, on one side to the live and one side to the neutral and it's coiling all the way up on the inside of the forge and making sure that it doesn't make any contact with the graphite crucible because that would short out the coils. And now the forge is ready to test out. As you can see when I turn it on it, it starts to get hot really really quickly. I'm not actually going to be making a proper lid for the forge since I'm just going to place two fire bricks over the top and that should provide all of the insulation needed. 
So this electric foundry is now pretty much ready to use. It is by no means perfect and there are a lot of improvements that I'm planning to do and I'm going to talk about some of them at the end of the video. But for now what I can do is I can take my graphite crucible and I can put it inside. For those of you that are interested, this is a 3 kilogram graphite crucible. This forge will pretty much heat up all crucibles, but I think graphite crucibles are the safest since they've got the least chance of burning through. Make sure that whenever you're taking the crucible out of the forge, you always turn it off. And whenever you're putting metal into the forge, you also always turn it off to minimise the risk of electrocution. Because if you did actually accidentally touch the coils, they're live wires and you'd probably die. Here I'm casting a couple of ingots just by pouring them into an old baking tray that I use for casting ingots. I only use scrap for melting aluminium, so all of these ingots that I'm casting I've all got for free and all completely recycled, and the scrap that I'm using at the moment is actually some sections of old aluminium ladder, and this is a ladder that was unsafe and it was thrown away because it was broken, and to break them up into small enough pieces so that they fit in the crucible, I'm just whacking them really hard with a hammer on my anvil. It might not have been the quickest way, but it was quite satisfying. If you want to see how to actually cast something useful in a useful shape out of aluminium, I've got a lot of different tutorials on my channel on how to do lost foam casting and green sand casting and various different methods like that, and there'll be a link in the description down below where you can check out my aluminium casting playlist, and you can also see some of my older casting aluminium videos if you're interested. So overall this project cost me about £83, plus tools, plus time to make it, plus the electricity used to make it and the electricity used to run it, but at the moment that's pretty much ne negligible. That's actually really cheap compared to the high price of something if you're going to buy a forge like this off eBay, however those forges are quite a lot safer and they also do have temperature control. But still, I much prefer this forge since you can actually melt a much larger volume of aluminium. So, as I said earlier, this project is very far from complete and there are a lot of upgrades that I would have liked to do for this video, however I didn't have time to make them and also this video is getting quite long, so I'm going to stretch them into a separate update video which is hopefully going to come next week or the week after. If you're interested in any of these updates as I make them, you can follow me on Instagram and I'll be posting updates regularly about new projects on there. The link is in the description down below. So the first upgrade that I want to make to this foundry is going to be temperature control. At the moment you either turn it on or turn it off and it's either full power or no power at all. But I want to buy a PID temperature controller, a solid state relay and a high temperature thermocouple that I've already ordered off eBay and then it should be pretty simple to wire them up and make a proper control box and turn this into a really professional and proper electric foundry. Next I want to make a proper lid for the foundry. At the moment I'm just sliding some fire bricks on the top and moving them off and that's not very good. It does provide enough insulation but it doesn't look very good and it's also quite awkward to move them, especially when they're hot. Another method that you could use if you wanted to melt aluminium using electricity is an arc furnace, and Grant Thompson, the King of Random, has a really great video on how to use one of those, and I have attempted it in the past, but my arc welder only goes up to 100 amps. I don't think it's quite powerful enough. I really hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you've enjoyed the tutorial, and hopefully I've inspired you to get out and do some metal casting. I also really hope that you appreciate the effort that I've put into this video. At the moment I'm right in the middle of my GCSEs, but I've still had time to edit this video and it's taken over 44 gigabytes of video and 300 individual clips. So thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.